we have uh, three uh, uh, panelists here, and the Professor Kang In Suk, he is uh, also the speaker uh, in the last lecture, and then Chu Hyun Kim, uh, working for uh, Korea University, and Hyun Ong Park, working for uh, Chungnam uh, University Hospital. So, um, is there any comment or question from the panels? Yes, Professor Park. Yep. I have a question to Jeff. Thank you for your good lecture. Uh, you showed the uh, uh, new version evolute FX. So there are so many advantages compared to previous uh, device. So is there any uh, change of uh, the device uh, device profile for vascular access? That's an excellent question. And first of all, I want to, I, I loved that last lecture because I, I felt that we, we've worked very hard within Medtronic to provide evidence of the value of what we're doing. And I, I just, I think you did a very, very nice job summarizing all of the important information and the themes that we're trying to move forward. I just, I just loved it. It was great. Now, with respect to FX, there's not a difference in the profile, but there is a difference in the nose cone. So the nose cone now is like a dilator, like a sheath dilator, very smooth, so that you won't feel any resistance when you're entering into the common femoral that we may have felt with the older system. It's very atraumatic, very atraumatic for the tip. Now, one of the things that we're working on and I would wonder if you would find it valuable, is an expandable sheath. One of the advantages of Evolute Pro Plus has been its low profile, 14 French equivalent for the new generations. And that's lower, that's the lowest of all the ones for the 23, 26, and 29. It's a little bit bigger for the 34. But we, we, we are in the process of trying to develop an expandable sheath that could be as low as 10 to 11 French. And then it would be just like with the blue expandable valve, the expandable sheath goes in, then the valve goes in, and then you do the procedure and leave the sheath in for the pre-dill and for the post-dill, if you need to, and then remove everything at the end. So I'll ask you, would you find an expandable sheath worthwhile in your practice or do you like the li very low profile of the of the Evolute? What do you think? So, Dr. Chair, what do you think about the? I would rather, I would rather prefer low profile device. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. And we have we'll have that. Yeah. So 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 this the the FX will be low profile. I, I don't think we can make it any smaller but it will maintain with all the added features that low profile plus add in the, um, the added advantage of, um, of not having any trauma with the dilator as it moves up, dilator like for the nose cone. Yes, uh, it's very important because of uh, the delivery system, the profile become uh, slender and slender. The, it uh, have uh, some damage for scaffolding power of the DAVA system. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I think um, uh, we can negotiate the uh, scaffolding power and then uh, the profile of the delivery system. So yeah. I have a question about the, um, the durability of the valve because uh, uh, now we are treating the younger patient more and more. I think uh, in the future, we will have a lot of patients uh, uh, age under 75 something. So. Um, the durability issue is very important. So it, you uh, already show the durability of the, um, uh, the uh, self-expandable valve system. So, uh, so one of the uh, issue is the uh, structural valve deterioration. So I think um, um, the uh, SVD uh, in the cyber system is a 3.5 something in in the five years, and uh, the Especially, you, you show the small annular, small annulus, uh, uh, patient having small annuli 
and has a very, um, uh, I mean, the very big difference between the self-expandable valve and cyber system. What, what, what it make a uh, very big difference? Uh, so because of the cyber uh, is uh, um, the small annulite, there uh, might be a higher chance of a PPM. So is there any other explanation about the big difference? Yeah. In the, yeah. I think it relates to the differences in the residual gradients. Because when we go down to smaller annuli, whether it's a balloon expandable valve or a surgical valve, when we're in the annular diameters of 23 or less, that's where we did our cutoff, the differences in the gradients can be four to six millimeters in mer millimeters of mercury, and it's probably three to four millimeters in the larger valves. So I think that that gradient differential makes a big difference. But I think that you've touched a very important point, which is that, um, that, that with surgery, the, the residual gradients are determined a little bit by what the surgical valve size is. So most of the valve, surgical valve size were 19 and 21 some 23s in the smaller annuli. And that's what the surgeons already know that they try to put larger valves in. So we're doing more root enlargement procedures now in the US and trying to put larger surgical valves in because it's something about getting the gradients as low as possible in that small annuli subset. And I'd ask maybe for you because we need to learn more. Are most of your patients having smaller annuli where the valves that you need are in the 23, 26, 29 evolute range. Is, is that what you find in Korea? Not so small. I, I think that the, the Korean patient is not so, not so small, uh, have some Mid-range or annualized. Mid-range, yeah. So, yeah. I have yeah. I have some questions. So, do you have any data on the durability issue regarding the bicuspid aortic stenosis patient? We don't. We don't. Um, we, just one year data so far. Um, our limitation in the U.S. studies is that bicuspid disease is relatively uncommon. It's probably less than 10% of our patients. And even more uncommon are CBR zeros. So, so we do need to have some longer term durability study in bicuspid patients from your teams in the Asia Pacific theater where the prevalence of bicuspid is so much greater. So we do have one year data. We're following all the patients longer but right now we've only reported one year. Things look fine to one year, but we've not reported the, the structural valve deterioration rate in bicuspid disease yet. We have no reason to think it's not gonna be good because I think a lot of it's by gradients, but I think the lifetime management becomes much more um, challenging in younger patients with bicuspid disease. And we need to start sorting those things out. But we'll learn from, from your teams in, in the Asia Pacific. Okay. Uh, we need more data about the uh, bicuspid disease. And then uh, uh, some surgeons uh, um, have a, a question about the uh, durability regarding the uh, tissue valve used in the, uh, the, in the system. So is a porcine or bovine. Uh, is there any difference between, uh, uh, regarding in terms of uh, the durability? of the tissue, tissue yeah. valve. So, so the Edwards studies use just Edwards valves. Our studies mostly used Edwards valves, but allowed the, 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 the physicians to make other choices about other valves. So there's some mosaic. There's a few uh, trifecta. There's not very many mitral flow. But we found the biggest determinant of SVD in the surgical patients, even more than the valve type used, was, was using a smaller valve, using a 19 or 21 
compared to a 2325. That, that that was what was driving the higher rates of structural valve deterioration. We will continue to follow patients for the long term. When we use the precise definition, the precise one as written in VARC, with our data and using the numbers for partner 2A that I showed earlier, the numeric rate is, is just a little bit lower with our core valve studies than with surgery using the exact criteria. But it's not a head-to-head -head trial, so we don't know. But we do think that ultimately valve type will be important, but more importantly, not putting small valves in is gonna be the biggest determinant for better surgery in the future. And of course, all the companies now are working on better valve leaflet material that has better durability. And, and that, that will certainly be one of the answers in the future. Yes, and, and a final question about the durability of the, uh, uh, the tower system. Because uh, uh, from the notion eight years data, uh, there is a big difference between the uh, server and tower system uh, in terms of uh, structural uh, valve deterioration. But uh, the summation of non-SVD, uh, uh, the, the uh, difference was uh, uh, already gone. So um, uh, I think uh, uh, it's uh, non-inferior to the server is the, uh, it's the important thing, or uh, if we are uh, uh, think about the non-SVD is the uh, the huddle uh, something huddle for the durability issue. So what yeah. do you think about non-SVD? Yeah. yeah. So so the early core valve and our core valve as well. The non-structural valve deterioration by the VARC criteria has two factors. It has PPM, and that falls in favor of the core valve device and it has significant paravalvular regurgitation, and that goes against the core valve system compared to surgery. So those balance out. The, the other component for bioprosthetic valve dysfunction is thrombus. And I think from our data so far, numerically it's lower, but it's not statistically lower than surgery with our valve. So I think that the reason that Dr. Sundergaard's paper showed non-inferiority, didn't show a betterment for core valve was because the numbers got small. Numerically, there was a 30% reduction, but the numbers were small, 10 and seven, I think. But, but, they, but the, the other components that went into the totality of bioprosthetic valve failure really were the PPM, which calls in favor of, the, of ours, and paravalve regurgitation. In the recent data, we've certainly done better now with paravalvular regurgitation than in 2010 when the study started, where there was the 15% rates of moderate to severe. So I do think that it's going to be a little bit of a balancing act, and we do need to think of the totality. I think when, that's why in our SMART trial, we're using the totality of bioprosthetic valve dysfunction, which will include SVD, PPM, paravalvular regurgitation, and thrombus. So, so in our SMART trial, randomized, Balloon expandable will have all the components that you described. Okay, and and any comments? So I think um, I have a, a, a question about the FX system. Uh, it is a uh, um, the coaxial deployment is a uh, our best option, uh, our best uh, advancement of this system. I think um, um, so. Uh, coaxial deployment is a uh, uh, very important to locate the distal end of the valve in the, uh, uh, the desirable or optimal uh, location. But um, if the uh, aorto uh, uh, LVOT angle is very stiff, uh, more than 60 degrees something, is it uh, still uh, working in, in that kind of horizontal heart? And the second question is, uh, uh, if we are using uh, this kind of a coaxial deployment system, uh, it uh, can be reduced the popping off of the uh, uh, the valve during the deployment. So, yeah. Yeah. so those are look. I'm old enough that I remember when all these new valve generations were available everywhere in the world, 
except for the United States. And, and that was the way it used to be. And so our FDA now has made a much more streamlined pathway. So we're seeing many of these devices first in the US and then disseminated out to the rest of the world. We have to get as fast as possible an approval of FX for, for, for Korea so that you can actually give us your own impressions when it becomes an approved device and available. We have FDA approval in the United States. And so the first 100 cases, we've really starting to get a good idea of how it handles. And most of our early implanters took the Ferrari and went on the Grand Prix course and took it everywhere. Hard cases, tortuosity, horizontal aortas. What the consistent feedback from our U.S. physicians, Dr. Puri, Dr. Adazani, Dr. Gada, Dr. Chikuti, is that the situation you described of a very horizontal aorta is better treated now with FX than it was with Evolute because of the, because of the coaxial. And secondly, when the tabs are released, there's less tension to cause that movement that may relate in a pop-out. So I think that having this, this stability layer and less tension in the system, one spine, not two, is gonna to add to a better deployment. We are 100 cases in, in the United States, 100. So we're just getting started. And we'll keep track every single week as we start to get, gain our experience better. But I think it will make a difference. And the most important focus for us is to make sure we can get it in your hands as fast as possible through the regulatory authorities. Okay, I have a question to uh, Professor Kang. Yeah. <laughs> so after uh, you're uh, introducing the custom overlap technique in uh, during the uh, Taba system deployment, so how can you reduce, how could you reduce the uh, rate of permanent pacemaker implantation. Is there any, some data for your uh, daily uh, practice? Uh, even though I um, not statistically analysis uh, my data, but uh, cost of overlap view provided me some uh, pace about the depth of the uh, valve depth and it make me more comfortable and no need to uh, <coughs> manipulate the valve level. If I start to the center of the pig tail head, and sometimes, as I previously showed the cases, sometimes uh, there are some variation, the level of the starting uh, deployment level, but uh, I feel uh, it may it gives me many helpful to uh, reduce the uh, permanent pacemaker implantation, even though I sometimes uh, experience the LBBB after the procedure. I have one more question. So you have shown that the, the old lady, eight, eight, five year old female, she have the annual angle over around 85 degree? Yes. So. How can you bravely choose the self-suspending transfemoral IFU criteria at 70 degrees? Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, because uh, she has chunk of calcium in LCC and also the calcium expanded the LVOT. So I'm worried about the rupture if I use the valve, balloon expanding valve. Yeah, so quite reasonable. So um, the, uh, the final uh, question to Jeff. Yeah, as uh, you uh, uh, nicely explained the uh, the cusp uh, alignment uh, regarding the coronary osteum. So, so if we uh, are using the future system, uh, we can easily. Uh, align the uh, valve to the uh, coronary osteum. But uh, the previous one, uh, 
uh, we cannot uh, see which orientation is uh, yeah. aligned. So if you are using the tower in tower, especially yourself in self, so how can you uh, uh, orient? Uh, how can I uh, uh, the check out the uh, orientation and the cusp alignment? Yeah, uh, it's an excellent question. Um, and that's why we put FX markers on the FX, I mean, quite frankly. So the hat marker in the LEO projection to the left side of the screen is, is a good indication. And then in the cusp overlap, center front is, is, is good. That's what we're seeing. Putting the flush port in at three o'clock over 80% of the time takes the catheter to the right place. But, but that's why we're close with the situation that you've described, but we're not perfect with the Evolute Pro or Pro Plus. What we need to do, that's why we have to get the markers on FX so you can see exactly where it is. So that's why the iteration step came around. But right now we're using the hat marker and the flush port. Okay. Is there another question or comment from the panel? Yeah. I have one more question, Jeff. <clears throat> you may have performed the type of procedure more than uh, <coughs> uh, several hundred. Yeah, that's yeah, a, more. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, a lot. Yeah. Uh, do you have any cut point AEG for tarpy for tarpy or sarpa? Do you have? Do we have any cut points for age? AEG. For age. Yeah. Um, our yeah. guidelines, our guidelines for the U.S., which we follow in our clinical practices, suggest that patients under 65 years old that are otherwise healthy should have surgery. 65 to 80, it's a heart team discussion. And patients who are over 80 should generally get TAVR. The European guidelines increase that age to 75. 75 and less for surgery and then over 75 for TAVR. I think that what we do is we try to measure the risks and the benefits of both. And I would say that if there's a younger patient, 65, and they're low risk for surgery, but they're high risk for TAVI, bicuspid, calcified RAFI, very calcified leaflets, probably, that patient should go to surgery because they're low risk for surgery and the surgeons will remove all the calcification for the circular valve in as big as possible. And, and even though we could do TAVR by our guidelines, if it's a high risk case for TAVR, then we will want to make sure that we get the patient to the right therapy. So the age I think is a cutoff that is, is fluid. It's based on a discussion with the patients, at least in the United States, about the risk benefits. But we have to think about both the surgical risk and the TAVR risk for both extremes to make the right patient. In the US, usually 65 to 80 is a heart team discussion. And then the patients usually end up having TAVR. Okay. Um, what is your average age? What is your average age you created? You say it's getting down to 70 years old now? Average uh, age for patients in, in Korea? In Korea? So, um, so it's uh, uh, late in the 70s. Yeah, late 70s, yeah, yeah. okay. But coming down, say, so, yeah. yeah. So I, I believe we all have a lot of uh, points uh, to discuss with, uh, but uh, uh, the time's up. So uh, I especially thank you for the uh, Dr. Palmer to join us. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Give us a, a great lecture. And then... Uh, I think uh, I'm, I always thank you to the Professor Kang and panelists to uh, uh, talk. Yeah, joining uh, this session. So I'd like to close this session. Uh, I hope we will uh, see face to face in, in the near future. Yeah. yeah. So thank you for joining us. Thank you. I'd like to close this session. Thank you very much. Thank you.